Добро пожаловать на площадку онлайн-форума «Беларусь-2020. Научные практические вызовы в применении принципа универсальной юрисдикции». От имени Центра конституционализма и прав человека Европейского гуманитарного университета рада приветствовать участников, экспертов и членов команды организаторов. Меня зовут Людмила Ульяшина, я ассоциированный профессор ЕГУ, руковожу комитетом программы «Международное право и право МИС», а также Центром конституционализма и прав человека. Мне предоставлена честь модерировать первую секцию нашего собрания. Но хотела бы начать с некоторых технических деталей, коллеги. Во-первых, наша встреча будет проходить на двух языках. И участники могут выбрать язык, на котором они хотели бы слушать презентации. На экране справа есть кнопка «Перевод». Выберите, соответственно, русский или английский. Если у вас маленький экран, то эта команда появляется под значком «Три точки». Свои вопросы вы можете выкладывать в разделе «Вопросы и ответы» в чате или поднять руку. Там есть такая команда, вы ее тоже найдете на экране э, компьютера. Вопросы эксперта вы можете задать после завершения секции. И есть только одно исключение для э, нашего первого докладчика, господина Гнатовского, который покинет нас, к сожалению, сразу после доклада. Поэтому ваши вопросы вы можете задать ему сразу. Идет аудиозапись нашего мероприятия, и она будет доступна в Фейсбуке после завершения мероприятия, но без перевода. Модераторы встречи приглашают докладчиков, и сами докладчики включают звук и камеры. Участники будут видеть только докладчика в момент презентации. Важно держать микрофоны отключенными, если вы не говорите. Если вы получили право задать вопрос, вы сами включаете микрофон. Отключение микрофона возможно тоже организаторам, если вы забыли это сделать. Модераторы будут следить за вопросами в чате и предложат докладчикам ответить на некоторые из них, а может быть и на все успеем. Наша онлайн-международная встреча – вторая в рамках проекта Центра конституционализма «Адвокаты для Беларуси». Первая встреча была в сентябре и проходила под эгидой Совета Европы. И цель этих мероприятий, встреч, э, в том, чтобы юристы, ученые, практики, неравнодушные к тому кризису, который случился в правовой системе Республики Беларусь, могли помочь остановить безнаказанность за действия, которые возмущают международные сообщества. Важно помнить, что в 2010 году Беларусь была среди 44 государств, которые отправили доклад генеральному секретарю ООН в рамках работы над резолюцией о поощрении применения принципа универсальной юрисдикции и предотвращения безнаказанности. Беларусь была за применение этого принципа на практике. Де-факто, однако, эти положения законодательства не заработали. I would like to invite Daniel Zalimov, the president of the Constitutional Court of Lithuania, professor uh, of uh, Nicholas Renis University, uh, with his introduction speech. Thank you. 
Oh, hello, I don't know if you see me. Well, for me, it's a great honor to welcome uh, you all here with such a beautiful initiative. So let me greet you and thank all the organizers of this forum. Maybe I cannot list everybody, but of course, these are representatives of the European Parliament and the Center of Constitutionalism of the European Humanities University. You know, the topic of uh, universal jurisdiction is relevant uh, for many years. And of course, each painful event connected to a uh, commission of international crimes uh, in a certain country, and this is how we can uh, characterize Belarus right now, I think uh, it always raises the issues of responsibility. And the issue of responsibility, of course, uh, they are natural because each crime and this is the main principle of law and the rule of law. It should lead to liability for this crime. Otherwise, uh, there will be no effective prevention, effective uh, struggle against uh, such uh, phenomena as international crimes, crimes against humanity that uh, I believe uh, really take place now in Belarus, and of course, to discuss this topic uh, is very important for several reasons. In fact, uh, I believe the very concept of uh, universal jurisdiction, of course, you are going to talk about it uh, uh, a lot deeper, but uh, the very concept of youth cogans uh, that are universal, uh, that are recognized by the whole international community, uh, that establish universal challenges, including the, like, the protection of a uh, human and of life and dignity of a human, and of course, violation of such norms of youth cogans And you know it very well, it leads to liability, not only between the parties, not only uh, for the person uh, whose rights were violated, but this is also responsibility uh, in front of the whole international community. That's why international community uh, took up the obligation to fight with such crimes, to uh, prosecute such crimes and not uh, talking about genocide, maybe, but really uh, crimes against humanity, including mass torture, including mass uh, persecution for political reasons, and that's what's happening, what's happening in Belarus, uh, they also uh, cannot remain unpunished. And of course, then we uh, face the problem of effectiveness of usage of such norms, of criminal responsibility according to the international law, because in many countries, and I think uh, the criminal code of Belarus is not an exclusion, although I haven't studied it, but I'm sure there are particular articles about responsibility for uh, such crime. Even if uh, they're not there, it would still be recognized as a crime according to the international law, because we all know about the principle of uh, prohibiting using uh, retroactiveness. So, which is not right. And of course, so while looking for the ways how to make such norms effective, here we have the questions. Of course, we know about the International Tribunal, unfortunately, their jurisdiction. Well, I will not talk about uh, some exclusive cases, some unique cases, maybe Belarus. I mean, about the crimes committed by Belarus. Maybe there would be an ad hoc tribul tribunal not necessarily according to the decision of the Security Council, but uh, if uh, the regime changes in Belarus, it probably could be done uh, according to the international treaty. But of course, uh, international tribunals uh, such as International Criminal Court uh, has jurisdiction here that depends uh, on the agreement of the parties and then. Uh, in this case, Belarus uh, is not a party to the Rome Statute uh, so, it would be 
kind of difficult to think of ways how to effectively use uh, the jurisdiction of this court. And then certainly, alternatively, uh, we can uh, speak of uh, something that we call universal jurisdiction, universal but national jurisdiction, when some countries have in their criminal legislation such provisions that they can uh, prosecute people for international crimes committed by them, including a crime uh, against humanity, despite the fact uh, where they were committed uh, and uh, what was the nationality of uh, persons who committed them. This could be one of the effective alternatives, should I put it like this, of international jurisdiction. Because really, if many countries use such uh, jurisdiction, or for instance, uh, towards representatives, or I don't know how to call them, representatives of de facto power in Belarus, because it's not legitimate in Belarus, then naturally this could serve as a certain preventive measure uh, for such crimes not to be committed further on and effective uh, federal prevention, so to say. But of course, uh, while discussing universal jurisdiction, we should always have in mind that we know that such countries or maybe such regimes uh, because I don't want to speak uh, about the country as a whole, but such regimes as the Russian regime and the Belarusian regime, they can always uh, use universal jurisdiction and start uh, prosecuting for allegedly committed crimes uh, the people who fight for human rights, uh, who fight for democracy. And this happens sometimes as well. Uh, the so-called uh, fabricated uh, cases, uh, they can uh, be launched uh, by such countries with universal jurisdiction. Uh, we, can, we should always have this in mind, but of course this is not an argument against the very principle. I mean, the fact that such countries that I mentioned, they always uh, they can always uh, invent any kinds of cases uh, if they think it was feasible for them against any persons. And of course, this argument uh, cannot uh, be an essential argument against the very concept. And here, I would like to again welcome this initiative. And I think that the very idea of universal jurisdiction belongs. So the part of the legal community and lawyers in general are not indifferent to significant, uh, to essential understanding of the rule of law, uh, for whom who believe not only informal respect of law, uh, but yeah, there are certain values uh, in the law uh, that uh, the law should defend and things that are happening in Belarus. This is anti-law. This is not the law in itself because the practice of using the law destroys the fundamentals of the rule of law. So, you know, sometimes such, uh, there are not so many lawyers uh, like that in our community, but we know that, you know, active minorities who fight for the values uh, sometimes can do a lot. And they are the ones uh, who move the progress for the engines of the progress of humanity in defense of the values uh, uh, which put uh, people and their dignity in the center. So I would like to wish you all success and I would like to thank you for your initiatives that again prove that law should be understood not only formally but also by your heart, uh, with your heart. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, such an introductory speech.
and I think we will come back to it, uh, come back to your words in this forum and also later in our work. I would like now to invite the Professor of Law and Head of Department of Social Studies of European Humanities University, Yolanta Bebeskaita, to again uh, greet our forum and uh, express her greetings. Uh, dear participants of forum, dear colleagues, it's my honor to welcome you uh, on behalf of the Academic Department of Social Sciences of the European Humanities University, which is one of the organizers of this event. As you know, the European Humanities University was established in 1992 in Minsk. Unfortunately, due to political reasons, it was forced to move to exile and it has opened its campus in Vilnius in 2005. So far, it is the only Belarusian university that enjoys its academic freedoms. The Center of Constitutionalism and Human Rights, which is a part of our department, was established in 2005. In 2012, the center's activities aim at fostering the development of legal culture and establishment of the legal state and civil society institutes in Belarus and the region. So I would like to thank the coordinator of the center, Associate Professor Lyudmila Ryashina, for gathering us here. I'm sure the Center for Constitutionalism and Human Rights could keep serving as a solid platform for scientific as well as for practical events like this forum. So thank you one, one more time for being here and wishing all of us a fruitful discussion. Спасибо большое. Thank you very much. Uh for your directions, uh, and I will be very happy to introduce now uh, Director of the Office uh, from the Aden uh, Stiftung, Adenauer Foundation, Jakob Wollenstein. Would you please take a floor and say us few welcome words? Thank you. Hello. Um, we don't hear you, Jakob. Would you please switch on your microphone? I'm not sure he hears us. Okay. Тогда, коллеги, я, наверное, перенесу привет. Then, dear colleagues, I'll have to move from the words of Jakob Wallenstein, perhaps to opening of a second part of our meeting. And now I am very excited to give a floor to our first presenter, Mikol Ignatovsky, who is a professor of international law at Taras Shevchenko National University in Kyiv. And Nicola will talk about the introduction to the principle of universal jurisdiction and its compliance with international human rights standards. Thank you, Lyudmila. Good morning, everyone, dear colleagues. I am uh, very thankful for your invitation and it's a great honor for me to talk at the event of this caliber, especially with the presence of our Belarusian colleagues, leading experts on international law. I am very excited to have this online format and see Professor David, uh, Professor Ambas, Professor Zhilinskas, Professor Zhalimas. Uh, I would like to apologize in advance because I will not be able to attend this event fully. Uh, there's a, a, a plenary session of the European Committee Against Torture and I have to attend all the hearings as everything happens online. I, it is great because I can move just in a matter of a couple of minutes from Kiev to Vilnius and then from Vilnius to, to Strasbourg. It was great pleasure for me to participate in the first event um, that Ludmila has mentioned uh, under the auspices of the 
European Council, where we discussed with our Belarusian colleagues the possibilities that international law provides that would allow us to lead um, uh, in the fight um, with gross violations of human rights that are happening in Belarus today. And looking at today's events, it's of course a continuation of what has happened in September. And uh, today we have a chance to speak in more detail about the principle of universal jurisdiction, its implementation in international law context. Um, speaking about the events that took place in Belarus, of course, um, I, I wouldn't really dare to speak about the basics, but perhaps still I, I need to say a couple of words so that we share common grounds of our favorite discussions and um, look at the mechanisms of implementation of universal jurisdiction further. So the question of universal jurisdiction arises from the question of criminal jurisdiction of states uh, according to international law. State has jurisdiction of territorial character. And of course, uh, there are no doubts that states have jurisdiction to persecute for crimes that were committed on its territory. At the same time, international law uh, provides for an opportunity of the state to uh, carry out ex, um, jurisdiction extraterritorially, by which I mean not um, talking about the events that happen on its territory, but outside of its territory. And here are a few uh, reasons that a state can use for establishing this jurisdiction. First of all, a, an opportunity in many cases to establish a state jurisdiction towards the crimes committed by its uh, citizens abroad State also has uh, an opportunity to establish jurisdiction towards crimes that were committed against its citizens. Um, the so-called passive nationality principle, passive citizenship principle, Princip the principle of active nationality, of course, is more established in the international law and is uh, not questioned a lot. But um, even passive nationality principle is pretty well established and usable. Then states can use um, protective principle, um, which would be applied to crimes that the state believes is aimed against its main interests. This principle is less established in the international law than the passive uh, nationality principle. So I'm going from the most important to, to the least important here. But what's worth saying is that international law doesn't really object to establishing extraterritorial jurisdictions of the state most of the time. So it means that this extraterritorial jurisdiction can be successfully used and should not lead to any conflicts. Talking about universal jurisdiction principle, it's extraterritorial jurisdiction, not related to the crimes committed on the territory of the state, but the state is not attached to those crimes in any other way. Um, so there is no citizenship link, a person, for example, who committed the crime, no link um, towards the victim or very narrow national interest uh, of a particular state. It means that this jurisdiction is based on the nature of a crime itself. It's very important. As um, in 
Professor Jalimas mentioned in his introductory word, uh, we're talking about the fact that the values are being attacked, the values which are fundamental for all states in order to secure the rule of law. So we're talking about um, the attack on use codons, uh, the universal laws of the international uh, law. So states have obligations towards the whole international community. Uh, we're talking about erga omnes, not just uh, to avoid committing certain crimes, but also to react in certain ways should they be committed. So basis for establishing international jurisdiction can arise from um, universal international law, a contractual international law, the well-defined and easily implementable in cases where we have uh, specific contractual obligations. But also using general international law is also a possibility that cannot be excluded and speaking formally is, um, isn't in any way worse than the contractual basis. So we have to understand when we have an international contract, the application of a certain paragraphs and the reliability of it is much higher. I also want to say before we move uh, on to the Belarusian events. So basically, there are two types of universal jurisdiction. First of all, is limited universal jurisdiction, which is very practical and can be implemented. And in some cases, talking about uh, torture crimes specifically, it should be implemented by the state. So it's universal jurisdiction tied to physical presence a human or suspect of a crime on the territory of the state that performs universal jurisdiction. So when this person is physically present on the territory of a state, the state may um, consciously and uh, hope that it will lead to a positive outcome it will lead to a successful um, legal process and it can um, apply universal jurisdiction um, towards a specific person. So here we have non-limited uh, possibilities for universal jurisdictions. When a state in its criminal legislation provides prosecution for international, uh, on international basis for any individuals, regardless of their nationality and regardless of a place of the committance of a crime, and also regardless of the possibilities of its own legal system to reach that person. So talk about criminal procedure being performed with this uh, specific person being present on the territory of the state. So this absolute uh, criminal jurisdiction is, of course, problematic due to a number of issues um, in international law. Of course, it's understandable. It's not a secret to anyone who studied international law. There were instances when this jurisdiction would be imposed by the state. And of course, classical example is uh, Belgium legislation um, until uh, 1923. And it's also well known that international uh, UN uh, court in the case of Congo against Belgium in 2002, regardless of the um, presence of um, certain opinions within uh, the court, critique this concept and um, 
talked about the violations on the side of Belgium. So we're talking about uh, anyhow, this decision was um, a step forward for Belgium to change its legislation and um, finally say goodbye to this unlimited concept of international jurisdiction. Again, realistically, I believe that um, the problematics of the Republic of Belarus, in this context, we should think of universal jurisdiction in the case when a person suspected of committing a crime against international justice is physically present on the territory of the state that implies international jurisdiction. Uh, talking about the situation in the Republic of Belarus, what crimes are we talking about? First of all, mainly about torture. When we talk about torture, we have universal convention and Belarus is a party to that convention and the majority of states of the world are party to it as well. Uh, of course, all European states. So it's a UN convention against torture from 1984, which contains a number of the important articles which comprise the basis for persecution of persons guilty of uh, serious violations of human rights, mass violations of human rights, um, including uh, what's happening in Belarus and also torture. So article number four of the convention, the criminalization uh, of torture, which is responsibility of a state, and also articles five, six, seven, six and seven article five is especially important because it first of all obliges the state to implement um, criminal persecution uh, for torture uh, torture performed on the territory of the state um, towards citizens and uh, principle of nationality and also in cases when a victim of torture is the national of that state. And of course, with an exception for the state um, to deem this appropriate. But what is also very interesting here is point two of article five in accordance to which each state a party to the Convention Against Torture also has to take measures uh, necessary to establish its jurisdiction towards committance of a torture crime in cases when the suspect uh, is present on the territory of its state under its jurisdiction, and if the state is not extraditing this person in accordance with the convention regulations to one of the states that have uh, established its jurisdiction towards its crime based on active or passive nationality principle or territorial principle. So articles two and five of the UN Convention Against um, Torture should be interpreted in a way that it establishes the responsibility of the state to perform this limited universal jurisdiction towards um, persons who committed torture uh, when those persons are physically present on the territory of such state. And I think it's very important, and it's also important to draw the attention to the fact that article number five also has a, a provision number three, that the convention does not eliminate a criminal jurisdiction that would be performed in accordance with the internal legislation of a state, which means situations when the state actually wants to establish jurisdiction, universal jurisdiction, even without limitations, uh, without the obligation for a person to be physically present on this territory. But I believe it's important in the context of Belarus to 
implement point two of uh, Article 5 of UN Convention Against Torture, there is a pretty wide practice of Committee of uh, Against Torture of the United Nations, which often critiques states uh, for not um, fulfilling their obligations under uh, point two of Article 5 of uh, this convention and uh, talking about his son Hambre from Chad and his case when his question was reviewed um, by the Committee Against Torture. Uh, I'm not going to go into too many details of that particular case, but I would like to mention that uh, International Court of the UN, although did not uh, say so directly, that Senegal in this particular case where Mr. Ambre was present, uh, violated its obligation under point two of Article 5 of the Convention, the International Court still, the way it formulated its decision, agreed with the findings of the UN um, com Committee Against the Torture that such obligation exists. So what does it mean in practice? As I said in our first event, the states have direct uh, opportunity to apply principle of passive nationality with the victim of violation uh, of human rights is uh, uh, present uh, on the territory of a state, but also uh, talking about other crimes committed on the territory of Belarus by citizens of Belarus against citizens of Belarus. States also have an obligation to impose a, its jurisdiction and realize this criminal persecution so that all arises from the UN Convention Against Torture. But of course, it also depends on the political will of a particular state. So those are very important uh, moments. And I want to finish uh, by saying that international law, of course, is very developed, but there are a lot of nuances still. The practical realization of criminal persecution for uh, mass violations of human rights uh, in the Republic of Belarus through the use of um, general jurisdiction depends on the political will of a state. And in this particular area, I believe it would be um, important to pose this question on the level of the European Union and uh, European Parliament in particular. The, uh, it could um, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Colleagues, do you have any questions? I don't see them yet. Anatolia Betsko, uh, could you ask a question right now? If I understood you correctly, I see some kind of mark here. Jonas, could you help us, please? I don't see any questions on the screen. Colleagues, if you could raise your hand, I would know who to give the floor to. I hope Jonas will help us to gather the questions from the chat. I don't see them. I would like to ask the Professor the following question. Your recommendations about uh, adopting by the European Parliament a special appeal operation of some certain framework for implementation of universal jurisdiction towards uh, Belarus or maybe other countries. Uh, how do you think it should happen? Who should initiate that? And if there were any cases like that in, in the past? Yeah, thank you very much. There were cases like that in the past. Uh, usually it is initiated by political groups in the European Parliament. 
uh, this is quite a political question. So to say, but of course, there should be coordination of the governments uh, of the states uh, that are ready to do that. So in fact, a normal ethics like that. The issue about the necessity to make liable the persons who are guilty in serious violation of human rights in Belarus should so be on the agenda of the European states, European government, and certainly the uh, members of the European Parliament. And they should initiate the discussion in the European Parliament, uh, get the support of uh, groups, and such resolutions would be very useful for coordinating the activity of a uh, European state. It's clear that if uh, perpetrators are going to stay inside the Republic of Belarus, uh, then in fact it will be quite difficult uh, to call them liable, but these crimes are gross crimes, uh, they lead to the long-term and many precedents in my mind of a successful liability of a uh, persecution of uh, perpetrators would be a serious signal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicola. We will not uh, keep you here for a long time. I hope uh, the speakers will develop this topic, especially in the second part of our forum. Thank you very much. Then I would like to now give the floor to the senior lawyer of the oldest uh, human rights organization uh, of Belarus, uh, Pavel Zafelka. He also participated in our first forum, uh, but this forum is special, and the question that we asked Pavel, and we hope to get some understanding of why uh, rule of law is not possible in Belarus today. Uh, Hello, well, thank you for this opportunity. In the next several minutes, I would like to tell you that in general why this topic uh, and opportunities of a universal jurisdiction are so important for us. Of course, uh, the current situation is forcing us to look for alternative ways, alternative opportunities linked to inviting other states to participate in uh, the solution of the current uh, human rights crisis in Belarus. In general, I would like to say that here's the election the 9th of August, uh, the 20th have become the starting point for the beginning of severe and brutal repression against those who did not support uh, the authorities and personally Alexander Lukashenko at this presidential election. And those three, men, three months, uh, we, the human rights organizations and the victims of torture uh, did not make uh, any big progress uh, in uh, investigation of tortures, especially on the 9th and 12th of August. Moreover, now society gets new victims, and this is the result of the uh, impunity of the security forces and approval by the state of uh, the violence that they committed. Uh, what's important that at least uh, three cases of uh, people uh, uh, killed by uh, by the police. Uh, Alexander Krakowski, Gennady uh, Stutt. Although not all actions uh, that are defined as torture criminalized uh, by Belarus, nevertheless, we insist that the current legal norms still allow to prosecute uh, nationally the persons uh, who are servicemen or uh, police officers, and they committed uh, tortures or other acts of uh, prohibited treatment. The first thing that I, that I wanted to tell you about the response of the government to allegations of torture and unfortunately torture, uh, brutal treatment uh, is not uh, condemned by the government in general and 
uh, those uh, post-collection tortures that we're talking about were not uh, condemned by the government. I would like to first speak about uh, several top officials who now changed their position. They left their posts, uh, but still we cannot assess uh, that as them losing their positions they still got uh, maybe not equal but quite uh, high positions in the belarusian hierarchy well these people were not held responsible for uh, for what uh, uh, their ministries uh, have done Sokov and Vakunchi Karayev is the interim minister, but Sokov is the deputy Vakunchi, uh, the head of KGB. Uh, they were encouraged by Alexander Lukashenko, de facto leader of the state, uh, by uh, a new uh, uh, military position. I should remind you that after visiting the detention center, the epicenter, of tortures organized by the police. Uh, Deputy Interior, Interior Minister Alexander Barkov denied the usage of violence against those detained, so he did not condemn uh, the actions of the law enforcement officers. Also, the Minister of the Interior, Yuri Karayev, has said in several interviews that he's aware of beatings. Uh, he was aware of beatings of those who did not violate the law. In our report that we presented uh, also to the Moscow mechanism, came out in the beginning of October, we quoted Karayev, his interview on air of the ONT channel program, where he said that he takes responsibility for the injuries of random people at the protest, so he is somehow kind of apologize for those who just happened uh, to be accidentally in the area of the protest. But the first question about the fate of these random people that I have stated, and I quote, they cooled down there a little bit. We don't always even start the administrative process. Thus, he emphasized uh, uh, the uh, arbitrary nature of uh, many of the detentions. Also, he spoke about his promises to kind of sort out all cases of violence and abuse of power by the security force, then I quote, everything comes down, everything comes down. And again, I quote, there was an escalation on both sides when they knocked down your guys, uh, their composure begins to fail, this is very bad, I'm against it. Uh, it shouldn't be like this, we will deal with all cases, but not now, but when everything comes down. And, uh, Alexander Lukashenko stated in his interview with the Russian media, he actually denied the facts of torture and he misled uh, the audience. He said that at Akrestina, and I mean the detention center, Akrestina, the people who were detained there, uh, they were all outlawed, uh, convicted uh, 12 times, and being drunk and stoned, they attacked uh, the prison guards, and that's why they uh, started beating them. So such uh, a reaction, such a response uh, from the top officials of the country, it led to further a course of investigation. Uh, Actually, they did not change, but they uh, worsened the situation. Uh, and the, the new prosecutor general, Andrei Shved, uh, actually alternatively concentrated the attention of his uh, subordinates that they should prevent all kinds of uh, protest uh, signs or demonstrations. But he didn't say anything serious about the process of investigation or supervision over investigation uh, of uh, all those complaints about tortures that were filed. So as for the investigation itself, even if we understand this uh, procedure of uh, validation of facts, 
and according to our information, there was one piece of official information that there were more than 1,000 uh, statements, reports uh, of people about uh, them being tortured and uh, the head of the Lenin's uh, Department of Police of Minsk, Vitaly Kapilevich, who said at a meeting uh, with the residents of Lenin's District of Minsk, uh, he spoke about uh, 1,800 reports uh, to the investigation committee uh, by people who survived torture. This is not uh, official information, so to say, but it gives us uh, an understanding about the scale of torture, tortures, and about the scale of uh, complaints of the victims of tortures about cases. How many were reported to police? On August 17, by the way, we already knew about more than 600 uh, complaints to the investigative committee. And uh, on August 19, the Globes and Helsinki Committee, our colleagues uh, addressed the head of the investigative committee uh, with the man to uh, start a criminal case under Article 198 of the Criminal uh, Code, uh, Crime Against Humanity. And on September, the 2nd of September, uh, the investigative committee refused to satisfy their appeal uh, without giving any grounds. They just said that uh, there are no reasons and grounds uh, to start a criminal case. And in response to a further complaint to the prosecutor general and the, the chairperson of the investigative committee, then they responded that because uh, our colleagues are not direct victims uh, of uh, such uh, illegal activities, uh, they cannot uh, ask uh, for a criminal uh, prosecution of the perpetrators. And they cannot complain about the elements of the criminal procedures, proceedings. And on August 13th, I uh, addressed uh, the prosecutor of Minsk uh, with the statement on uh, the disproportionate use of physical force and special weapons uh, and uh, torture and cruel human treatment uh, by law enforcement officers. And I asked uh, to uh, start a criminal case uh, under Articles 4 to 6 and Article 455 of the criminal code, the articles that establish responsibility for abuse and misuse. Uh, uh, of power in action, uh, when power and deputy prosecutor of Minsk uh, refused uh, to start a criminal case, but uh, he sent uh, my appeal to the investigative committee, so where they kind of took it into account and they informed me that uh, now they are. Uh, trying to validate uh, the facts that I reported to them in the manner prescribed by law. I will also address the uh, prosecutor general asking to start the criminal article, uh, start criminal uh, under article 128 uh, for uh, tortures, usage of tortures, but they did not respond to us. So, so what the officials do, the, the official tel telegram channel reported uh, that the investigative committee continues to conduct uh, pre-investigation checks, uh, that uh, the inter-agency commission uh, was created, uh, uh, where uh, members of our particular general's office, investigative committee, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, and the State Committee for Forensic Examination uh, take part. Uh, this commission uh, is not an official body of investigation, we believe, uh, uh, its goal is to, uh, to hush up uh, the problem of tortures of concrete people in some kind of general conclusions, although the public has not seen any conclusions uh, from this commission, but we are kind of expecting them to do something, uh, like conclusions uh, also. Uh, the Belarusian mission to investigate torture 
and unfortunately both uh, uh, chamber of the parliament responded to our colleagues that uh, they do not see any necessity to do that they said that uh, the investigation uh, will be done in a different way about those validation checks uh, that are done now everywhere by the investigative committee uh, most of them are suspended uh, uh, due to the fact that they did not receive the results of the expert examinations they are talking here about uh, expert examinations uh, about uh, uh, severe injuries uh, actually they are not uh, a good enough ground to start an investigation uh, so uh, the decision uh, to start uh, criminal cases uh, do not really depend on such uh, proofs. And, uh, we can find uh, examples in our national law enforcement practice of that. At the same time, we cannot say that this situation that we have now, that this situation is a complete failure. Uh, this wouldn't be really right to say actually what's happening now in the sense of investigation and the activity of uh, the public about uh, the evidence we have. Uh, this is a unique uh, situation when the victims are known in such a scale and those people are ready to witness uh, about the tortures uh, were used against them and uh, the cruel treatment uh, that was used against them and uh, all their names are known uh, to the human rights defenders, human rights defenders documented uh, many of their stories. And I should point out that uh, the investigative committee still uh, quite critical towards it, but uh, they still uh, collected certain evidence. Uh, uh, some of the victims uh, gave them uh, their clothes uh, that they wore during uh, the tortures. Uh, and they gave uh, all the, the pictures of uh, the perpetrators and uh, they indicated the police units uh, that participated in torture. And uh, having all this evidence and uh, having in mind that uh, after all those validation checks uh, are over, the term of uh, keeping those uh, proofs uh, is quite long. They will be kept. Uh, at least uh, during 10 years, uh, if they kind of uh, do that, uh, according to the law, more or less, uh, then it gives us uh, hope that uh, all this evidence can be used uh, by a different state or if the situation changes uh, in Belarus. But uh, this is kind of a dead end situation. Uh, now in the country and it uh, makes us look for the ways to uh, to find uh, ways to overcome this uh, general uh, impunity that we face. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pavel. Uh, thank you for your work. Uh, this is quite dramatic. So you leave the hope. And I would like to invite Victoria Fyodorova uh, head of uh, legal initiative uh, NGO. And of course, the question that we would like to answer, and hopefully Victoria will say more, how do we solve the impunity problem in Belarus? Thank you, Ludmila. Thank you, dear colleagues, uh, honorable guests. It is very important that the problems of Belarus are not just internal problems and that our foreign colleagues see those issues, help us to keep Belarus uh, in the focus of the international community, keep on the agenda the topic of violation of human rights. It's very important to us. So I would like to talk about the many aspects of the problem of torture and uh, share my thoughts on what opportunities do we have for 
using the international law to resolve the situation of um, impunity that Pavel mentioned. Uh, a lot of time has passed since the first report of the use of torture, mass torture, which was used systematically. And up until present day, I would like to stress not a single criminal case has been investigated, not a single person has lost their job. So first, I would like to bring your attention to the fact that the prohibition of torture is one of the absolute uh, human rights. And uh, it is um, a principle that is not just mentioned on the regional, but also on the international level, on the uh, international humanitarian and criminal law. The, Convention Against Torture has currently been uh, certified by 169 states, which indicates an international consensus on the elimination of torture and ill treatment. So it's important to understand if we talk about the prohibition of torture and ill treatment, then we have two uh, important issues. First, responsibility of the states and individual responsibility of specific persons who committed those crimes. So I would like to start from the prohibition of uh, torture, which has been established on the international level, and it's a violation of human rights. Belarus, as a participant to the International Pact on Civil and Human Rights, has undertaken responsibility under Article 7, which um, states that no one should be subjected to torture, or cruel, and human or degrading treatment of punishment. So we see that Belarus violates this article. First of all, it directly uses torture. Um, and uh, second is the lack of effective investigation. So this is what we can talk about today. What problems do we face if we talk about the violations of the pact? And what opportunities does this tool provide to us? So as a participants, uh, we have a right to address the Committee on Human Rights, um, to address this committee uh, on the basis of violation of Article number Sample. Well, the problem is the duration of consideration of such cases. Currently, it's about eight years to reach a decision. And the second issue, of course, is the fact that our state does not want to comply with the views of the HRC. So our state um, has representatives uh, in the UN in Geneva and says that all the decisions of the Human Rights Committee are only recommendations, so our state doesn't have to implement them. Of course, we can also submit under Article 31, uh, claims uh, and this procedure can be used uh, when a certain state has uh, provided its statement and Belarus has done so. It has acknowledged the competence of the Human Rights Committee to review um, multinational claims. So we don't have a single claim in this area yet. However, in other committees we have um, cases already, so this opportunity still exists and any state can address HRC on the basis that Belarus does not comply with its obligations under the pact. When we talk about uh, um, HRC, I want to say that Belarus has not accepted the competence of the committee under Article 21 to review individual or multi-state claims. The only opportunity for um, the mechanism to function is Article number 20, which means that committee, if it receives uh, proved information that uh, of um, cases of use of torture, it uh, provides the state 
state with opportunity to collaborate under investigation of such claims. So, as it turned out, this procedure is also very lengthy, and of course, HRC has limited capabilities, and the main issue is the fact that the state has to comply. So, even if we see that inside the state there is absolutely no desire to uh, go into uh, the detail, trying to establish if violations actually took place, so there is no point going are using these instruments internationally. I also want to touch upon the question uh, which our forum began with. So what is very important to remember? But um, the prohibition of torture is an obligation ergo omnis, and we're talking about obligation um, towards the whole international community. So it's been internationally accepted that the prohibition of torture is a use Hobbins norm. So basically the international uh, UN court in the case of Barcelona um, has uh, noted uh, that obligations are gone. Obligations are that each state takes up on itself in the face of all states as a whole and the fulfillment of which it is legally interested as well as in the position of uh, UNILC. So, it is important um, because our today's situation which continues in Belarus is not an ended tour. We have new cases of torture in September and October and it is possible that they'll continue in the future. So it's not just internal issues of the state, those systematic mass prohibitions, violations of human rights, including torture, are now on a different level. So protection of those rights becomes an obligation in the face of international community. I would also like to touch upon uh, torture as a national crime. So, uh, as um, Vital said, although there's not a separate article in Belarus, we still have a number of articles criminalizing torture and talking about this specific situation that happened in August in particular. We can talk about Article 128 of the Criminal Code, which states crimes against uh, uh, the security of mankind and provides a deportation, uh, legal detention, enslavement, mass systematic executions without trial, kidnapping followed by the disappearance, torture or acts of population are punished with imprisonment for a term of 725 years, so life imprisonment of, of death penalty. So. I would also like to note a very important moment that not so long ago, uh, our criminal code uh, had an appendix to this particular article, which prescribed uh, what torture actually means. And they took a citation from the Convention Against Torture. So basically, our criminal code uh, describes uh, torture exactly like the Convention Against Torture. So what does it say? We have a specific framework which allows us to use in within framework of na various national legal systems this unified description. So basically it doesn't allow a dependent state to interpret torture how they like, we all have to follow this one universal regulation. So the question of jurisdiction, which has been established by the Convention Against Torture, has been um, discussed previously. So uh, I would like to stress that Belarus, of course, is a party to that convention. And this convention obliges states to implement implement jurisdiction on the territorial principle. 
principle of uh, nationality, principle of uh, victim and their nationality, but I would like to add that we have the first signs of implementation of this article. We know that in Poland there's been a criminal case instigated on the fact of the torture of two journalists, and we will follow closely uh, what happens next. And last is the fact that the state can take measures which are necessary to establish jurisdiction if um, the persecuted person is uh, present on any territory. Uh, so that's talking about international law. And the last topic I would like to touch upon is um, connected to a convention against torture. I would like to mention Article 7 of a statute of uh, uh, International Criminal Court. So we talk about crimes against humanity and torture falls under that and other inhuman acts of similar nature also included. So the statute also views torture in a slightly different uh, description compared to the UN Convention. So torture means the willful infliction of severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, on a person who is in the custody or control of the accused. But torture does not include pain or suffering that results only from legal sanctions, is inseparable from those sanctions or is caused by them accidentally. So, all the terminology is a little bit different from the terminology of a convention against torture. Here we have the key elements that are exactly the same. So we talk about the infliction of severe um, physical or psychological pain and suffering. It's not a question about um, an element of state as a subject of the crime, but there is an element of control. And this element is viewed very broadly. It's We're not just talking about being under custody, which talking about the situation in Belarus is applicable to absolutely all situations of use of torture in uh, basically any um, any rooms of uh, the police departments where people basically did not go through any legal procedure. So if we talk about the terminology of international uh, criminal court, we can say that the events that took place can qualify under this description. Talking about the practice of the tribunals, the, um, uh, especially the tribunal on uh, former Yugoslavia, the practice of tribunal has developed uh, a description which is based on the UN Convention Against Torture and does not contain any additional or very different elements of crime that basically help us to qualify what happens in Belarus at the moment as an international crime. Talking about the main issues related to international crimes, uh, of course, the fact that Belarus is not uh, a member of an uh, international criminal court, so juris its jurisdiction uh, is uh, not applicable uh, to us, is non reachable to us, and with the current authorities, we cannot implement any of its decisions. Talking about tribunals that are established by the UN Security Council, then we have to raise the importance of uh, this question internationally. And of course, the necessity uh, of support of uh, five current uh, members of the uh, UN. Um, a council and world know of a country that is a, a one of those members and of course this will never happen so of course as a lawyer as a, i am worried that the longer the conflict will last the longer 
uh, this uh, legal default situation will go on, there is a possibility that when the authorities will change, there won't be enough specialists in the legal system in the prosecution system who would be able to carry out investigations of what happened and legal persecution of uh, those who committed those crimes because the longer this torture and um, a violent cycle goes on the longer persecutors remain inactive of course they will be punished for their acts not uh, just a regular um, police officers will be held responsible, but also persecutors who uh, must initiate criminal cases. Um, they will be punished too for the inaction. So if we talk about the change of regime in Belarus, there'll be a question, who will investigate those cases? Who um, will judge uh, those culprits? So I would like to and here, uh, thank you. Victoria, действительно, за очень содержательно, обстоятельный обзор о возможных и невозможных. Thank you, Victoria, for this overview uh, regarding different mechanisms of reaction. And now we can move to the topic of universal jurisdiction. Dear colleagues, you have an opportunity to ask questions addressed to our participants from Belarus. It's a unique opportunity and I understand there's been a lot of information and uh, from my side, I would like to say that we uh, plan on continuing gathering information and exchange of opinions. If some information was not provided, please wait for further uh, presentations and uh, hopefully they will provide the basis for new questions and the Center for Constitutionalism and Human Rights of EHU is always open for establishing work platforms. If there are no questions, I will be happy to give the floor uh, to my colleague, Christina Szelinskas, and we are moving to the second part of our forum, where we're going to look at the issues of the national practical implementation of the principle of universal jurisdiction. The floor is yours, Christina. Uh, thank you very much, Ludmila. Uh, thank you for an opportunity to participate in the seminar. I will switch to English now. Great pleasure, and it's a great honor for me to be here in this seminar. And I think that these topics are extremely important, uh, having having in mind what kind of situation we have in Belarus. And I think that. Uh, uh, the input that we will hear today from uh, very distinguished colleagues uh, on national um, jurisdictions uh, could be, uh, or at least could provide some answers that are heavily needed in order to somehow to, to seek for the justice of the victims of, of those uh, um, huge uh, human rights violations that have been committed. In, in, in Belarus just recently. Therefore, uh, I would like to ask uh, our first uh, guest, uh, uh, distinguished Professor K. Ambos, who is uh, a head of Department of Foreign and International Criminal Law and Chair of Criminal Law, Criminal Procedure and Comparative Law and International Criminal Law at the University of Göttingen, Germany. And also, he's a judge at Kosovo Specialist Chambers. Uh, and perhaps everyone who is dealing with international criminal law knows Professor Amber's uh, input uh, in different fields of international law. Therefore, I guess all of us would be very uh, excited to hear his uh, remarks. So Professor Am Ambos, uh, please, the floor is yours. Yes, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, can you we hear do. me? Yes, okay. yes, we do. Okay. Um, so, thank you very much for the invitation to this 
important meeting. And uh, I want to take up some of the very specific points which have been made by our colleagues from Belarus, especially Mr. Sapelko and Ms. Fedorova. I, I want to be very practical. I do not want to be very theoretical. I think Professor Knatowski has more or less set out the legal regime internationally, the possibilities um, to prosecute crimes committed in Belarus um, by way of universal jurisdiction. Let me just make one point to put this into the context of global justice, global criminal justice. I mean, our, I think our common aim and common goal is seeing the events in Belarus that we cannot accept that there is no accountability for any violations of rights of citizens who in a pacific way demonstrate be it in the worst form like torture or killings, but also in, in less, uh, less grave forms like arbitrary detentions and so on. We have to take the European Charter of uh, Human Rights and the European Convention as a starting point. So we have to uh, enable citizens to express their opinions and uh, give them the possibility to uh, exercise their rights without being threatened, intimidated by state forces. In a more serious way, if we talk about international crimes, we have heard from Mr. Sapelko, from Ms. Fedorova, and you all are much more informed about this than myself, being an outsider, what happens on the grounds. We have uh, possible cases of torture. We may have a systematic policy of persecuting dissidents, people against the current regime. So we may have what we call the context element in crimes against humanity, the systematic or generalized attack on a civilian population by uh, persecuting certain persons, by torturing, by detaining, by killing. And this, of course, gives this kind of practice a different um, a different level uh, than if we just had individual violations. So that's very important to take into account if we talk about accountability here and universal jurisdiction or anything which is not ter territorial jurisdiction. Of course, we know in such a situation, the territorial state will not do justice. Act actually, the territorial state is a violator. It's violating the rights of citizens. So, of course, this state is not able and willing to use the terms of Article 17 of the ICC statute to do justice, to give justice to the citizens. And that brings us to the situation that justice must come from somewhere else. Of course, we can always hope, as we do in Syria, in, in, in other situations, that there is a regime change and, and history tells us that things can happen overnight. But at, as things stand now, if you have a regime in place, there will be no justice from this regime. Rather, this regime is creating impunity. It is actually protecting the violators and the public officials uh, responsible for the violations. So then the question arises, where do we get justice from? And Ms. Fedorova, rightly mentioned the International Criminal Court. Of course, we cannot hope at this stage, being Belarus not a state party, and the Security Council in the hands of the P3, I, I would just say P3 because Russia, China, and United States are actually the players here, and they would always block the Russians in this case, followed by the Chinese, any referral of the Belarus situation to the International Criminal Court, as was done with the situation in Syria, as you know. So the Security Council effectively is blocking international justice, international criminal justice, and blocking jurisdiction of the ICC. 
change, then um, as has happened in Ukraine, as you know, the state can do an ad hoc declaration under Article 12.3 of the statute, i.e. a state without being state party to the International Criminal Court can transfer, give the court jurisdiction over a certain situation. That has happened in Ukraine. As you know, Ukraine is not state party to the International Criminal Court. But this is far from the reality of Belarus, given the fact that the regime um, is, not, uh, is not in any way giving uh, the ICC um, a possibility to intervene. So we are left with third states, what we call Um, uh, to name just a few, but also Scandinavian states, Sweden, Denmark, come into the picture. And so I want to tell you a little bit about German practice in particular here in this, in this regard, uh, because we have now quite some experience. You may know that Germany has, since um, 2002, when the ICC statute entered into force a specific regime for international crimes. We have a code of international crimes in German called Völkerstrafgesetzbuch. And we have a special section in our federal prosecutor. That's very important for you to know in Karlsruhe. In the federal prosecution service of Germany, you have a special section on international crimes. Um, Germany has for a long time prosecuted extraterritorial cases before the ICC statute in the 1990s, so last century, in the years 1992, 1993 and following, we had many cases of Serbian alleged war criminals from the war in the former Yugoslavia who came to Germany and um, uh, were coming as refugees. So we have a situation which may be very relevant for Belarus, where you have people coming to Germany as migrants, maybe applying for asylum. And you have also in this situation perpetrators. So it's not just that you have victims coming to apply. We had this situation in the 90s with Serbs, for example, famous cases which started at the appeals court in Bavaria and the appeals court in Düsseldorf. And we have the same situation, you may know, with Syrians. We have now running a very, very important case, the first case on torture in Syria under the Assad regime in Koblenz, which is an appeals court in the south of Germany also based on our law on international criminal uh, international crimes. And in this case, the actual suspects have been refugees in Germany and have been detected by other Syrians who are victims, also refugees in Germany. So imagine the Syrian community in Germany has between themselves figured out that there are former torturers of the Sadat's, um, Assad's secret service in Germany, and they have then been arrested and they are now tried, two persons. The, the case is highly reported. If you follow BBC or CNN, you see it in the international news. It's going on right now, and it was based in terms of evidence of the famous photos of a former military photographer of the Syrian armed forces, the so-called Caesar photos. And how did this case come before the German justice system? And that's a good example what could be done if, 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 if there is a political or strategic interest to, to go this, this road. First of all, of course, we have a very strong Syrian community in Germany and, and human rights activists from Syria here and then we have a strong civil society. We have NGOs, especially the European Center for Constitutional and Civil Rights in Berlin, based in Berlin, an NGO which um, uh, has a lot of trial experience. 
happens in these kind of cases. And then uh, we have, of course, a federal prosecutor, which has a specialized unit section, as I said, in Karlsruhe, and uh, where uh, now very experienced prosecutors, together with the federal police, the Bundeskriminalamt, work on these kind of cases. And then, of course, we have jurisdiction. Where does this jurisdiction come from? Maybe that's an important point. Of course, these are cases in Syria between Syrians. So the accusation is that Syrian public agents tortured Syrian citizens. So it's a similar situation to Belarus, you know. Belarus, um, allegedly, Belarus um, uh, uh, public agents commit crimes against Belarus citizens. In this situation, um, of course, the, the straight, most straightforward way of creating jurisdiction would be the so-called universal jurisdiction. But here I want to make a point which is a very practical point. I mean, we have this debate and Professor Knatowski has mentioned it of, um, he called it in the translation, of course, I do not understand Russian, so I hope it was correctly translated. He called it limited universal jurisdiction. In fact, he referred to a situation where the legal regime of a state requires presence of the suspect in the territory. In my view, this is just, um, this is a procedure requirement. I mean, Professor David will talk about procedure requirements. We can come back to this. Um, we have to distinguish between the concept as such of universal jurisdiction, which basically is a concept whose legitimacy rests on international crime. So if we accept what uh, Mr. Sapelko and Ms. Fedorova have said, and also Professor Knatowski, that there are international crimes which affect everybody, not just the victims or the perpetrators, but they are concerned to all of us, for example, torture, for example, crimes against humanity, then there need to be a forum, there need to be a jurisdictional possibility to get access to justice. There need to be an effective remedy. That would be the situation under the human rights uh, case law. Of course, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg will and would um, convict Belarus of violating the right to an effective remedy. If Belarus is not giving access to justice for crimes committed, it violates the European Human Rights Convention. We don't need to refer to the international covenant here because uh, we have the European uh, Convention and the European um, system. Um, so if we have such a situation where we have international crimes, we need a forum, we need some response. If the territorial state doesn't give the response, we have to go to third states and the way is then to use the legal regimes in third states, extraterritorial jurisdiction regimes, to come before these courts. Here, the key issue is procedural. It's not so much substantive. If you, if, if you take, for example, the German situation, we have in paragraph one of our law, of our specific law, which, by the way, has been translated into Russian too. Um, I could later send the link. Allows for universal choosing. It says any crime of this code, i.e. any international crime, genocide, crime against humanity, war crime, crime of aggression, committed outside the territory of Germany is within the jurisdiction of German courts. That's the universal jurisdiction in a very, very broad sense. But then we have a procedure rule in our procedure code, which basically requires that the suspect is present on territory. In other words, if you brought a case against the president of Belarus or any minister, any high official, you would have to hope that this person travels to Germany at a certain point. This sometimes happens, you know, these persons go to have medical treatment. We have 
Hosni Mubarak came to Bonn to have medical treatment, a former Egyptian dictator, and we have many, many cases, so it's possible. But you have to convince the German prosecutor that there is a real possibility that this person may set foot on German territory at a certain point, and that for this reason, the German authorities, the police and the prosecution should investigate and prepare a case to be ready if this person comes. In our experience, we, when we were not prepared in some cases, we had also some Eastern European cases, a former uh, uh, president of Ukraine before the revolution also came to Germany, but there was, there was nothing prepared, so it was too late. He stayed three, four days in the hospital, and then he already had left before the police acted. So what we call um, a kind of, in English, we would say a kind of um, reserve investigation. We, we do, um, we do um, collect evidence, we do investigate a situation, um, anticipating that at a certain point, the alleged suspect may come to Germany. Since in Germany, as in most system in practical terms, we, would, we do not have an in absentia procedure. That's also important to understand. You have it in France, for example. In, in a German criminal procedure, we need the accused. We cannot have a case against an absent accused. So we need the person in the German courtroom. And therefore, um, a German prosecutor is a very practical person. Normally, prosecutors are very practical persons. They are police more even, so they are not interested in theory. They will ask, can we expect to ever have this person in our hands? Can we ever arrest this person? Do we have a possibility that this person will come to Germany? And um, of course, there is this other model of regime change, but there is also the idea that this person may travel. And if this is the case, then you may convince the German prosecution service to start an investigation. And perhaps I can tell you, maybe they already start an investigation in Belarus. This is so much on the news. I, I'm, I have not talked to them lately, but maybe they are already investigating certain incidents because they are of public knowledge. Um, but this was, it was what happened in other cases, um, even cases in the situation of Libya in the situation of Syria, where German prosecutors have investigated um, high ranking officials of the regime, not in Germany, if, because they think there may be a point in time when these persons either fall or will come, and then we have the case prepared and we can go against them. And of course, there's also the possibility to do this in a secret way. That's why I cannot tell you if they do it, because they may do it, and it's not public information. It's not in the public domain. Of course, you, because you don't want to warn the possible suspects. You know that we have done this in international tribunals, in the former Yugoslavia, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. We do it in the Kosovo Specialist Chambers. We seal indictments. So we actually investigate in a secret fashion in order not to warn the possible suspect before being arrested. Um, so that's a, that's a common strategy, but it's, it's, that's a very practical point. And the other practical point, if you ever approach a German prosecutor, you should have evidence. That's why it's very important to have here uh, human rights uh, organizations, civil society being people on the ground. It's not a theoretical issue, it's a practical issue. What evidence can you offer? Do you have witnesses? Do you have photos? Do you have perhaps any other evidence, documentary evidence? We have a lot of evidence these days via video footage, via internet, that's maybe the good side of, of internet, Facebook, and all these things. Nobody can secretly commit crimes of this, of this ex, uh, extension these days because everybody knows that there are crimes committed. But it's all about the evidence. So if you ever have a meeting with a prosecutor or the prosecutorial office in Karlsruhe, 
And I'm sure that's the same for the French authorities, for the Belgians. Um, you have to bring evidence. You have to credibly convince them um, that you have enough evidence to link certain events to certain persons. Because there is another issue here, and that is attribution or imputation. You have to link, for example, if you go against a high-ranking official, high-ranking officials usually do not torture themselves. They do not kill them themselves. They have policemen, they have military to do the job, the dirty work. So you need evidence to link these people to the crimes. For example, chain of command evidence. Yeah, you can um, prove that a high-ranking official gave the order to shoot dem demonstrators, to arrest and make them disappear, to torture them. And that would be then the evidence you would need. So you have to have evidence from the bottom to the top to the high-ranking levels of power to link these people to the crimes committed. That's very important. So think about evidence all the time. Evidence, evidence, evidence. The law is there. The criminal law is there. You have people like myself and others who can help you in that. That's not an issue. But you are the ones who have to bring the evidence. Collect evidence. Mr. Sapelko, your NGO, Miss. Uh, Federova, you should document all evidence, bring them to a safe place, guard them, and there will be a possibility. That's also a practice for the private investigation. Someone has mentioned this too. You know that we have a third way now, or fourth way if you want, and that are these investigative commissions. You know that we have a commission on Syria on the basis of a general assembly resolution. That's another way to go. Given the situation that Security Council is blocking any effort with the powers, the three permanent members, there are other ways. People have gone to the General Assembly or even to the Human Rights Council. You know, the other investigation in Venezuela we have is a Human Rights Council investigation, yes, of Geneva, Geneva Human Rights Council, because you may get a majority here or in the General Assembly. If the European Union has a common position on Belarus, you can have a position, you can have a private investigation, either by way of a General Assembly setting up a in commission of inquiry, what we call commissions of inquiry, we have now getting experience here, or the Council of Europe. You go to the Council of Europe where you have a majority decision and where the big powers, Russia in particular, cannot block such an initiative. And these initiatives are important. Of course, these are not criminal tribunals. These are not criminal jurisdictions, but they are private inquiries under the head of an international organization, United Nations, Council of Europe, Human Rights Council. And they also collect evidence. It's all about collective evidence. Think in the next year's Every dictator will fall. No dictator can ever be in power and all these people who are responsible for crimes at a certain moment may fall and then we have the evidence. We, have, we can make a case. Okay, I will stop here. I'm very happy to receive any questions. We can, of course, go on with any dialogue. Thank you very much. I hope everything was translated fine. I'm, I'm sorry that I cannot speak Russian but uh, I think the translators certainly do a very good job. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Amber, for so many interesting uh, insights. And I think we will leave questions and comments after the, the, the report of, of Professor David, if you, if you wouldn't mind. So, okay, okay, good. So uh, now I would like to give a floor for Professor Eric David, who is Professor Emeritus at the Free University of Brussels and also a very well-known specialist of international humanitarian and human rights law. Uh, so um, Professor, floor is yours. We are waiting for your insights. For a moment, we can't hear you. Please turn on your microphone.
your microphone is off. Um, it's a button. That's okay. Oh, yeah, now it's okay. Okay, yes. Uh, wonderful. Okay, well, uh, well uh, I, I can be uh, very brief. First, first of all, th thank you very much for your invitation uh, to uh, take part uh, to this meeting. Uh, co according to, uh, I think, what you are expecting from me is mainly to know what's the status of uh, Belgian legislation uh, in the case of universal jurisdiction. And I quite agree with what has just been said by Professor Ambos uh, concerning the importance of evidence. Well, uh, in Belgium, uh, uh, as you probably know, in 1993, we uh, adopted a very ambitious law uh, which uh, allows uh, Belgium to prosecute uh, authors of uh, international crimes, of international law crimes. And uh, that, that let law was that uh, Belgium be became uh, uh, the, I don't know what's the English expression in French, we say la terre promise, uh, the, the land for uh, all people in the world who had, who get uh, sufferings uh, from uh, dictatorial regimes. And uh, unfortunately, as you know, there was the Yerodia case in 2002, where the ICJ considered that uh, Belgium went too far, not concerning universal jurisdiction. In this framework, in fact, in the very beginning, the DRC uh, argued that uh, the exercise of universal jurisdiction was a violation of its sovereignty. But finally, uh, during the oral, the oral pleadings, uh, the DRC stopped uh, saying, uh, arguing, contending this kind of argument. And finally, uh, the, the whole case uh, remained uh, focused on the problem of uh, criminal, of uh, immunity from criminal jurisdiction. And there, unfortunately, uh, Belgium lost. Uh, that was my most important professional failure in my career, unfortunately. Uh, we, we, didn't, we did not succeed uh, in convincing the court that in fact, uh, criminal uh, uh, immunity from criminal jurisdiction was not an argument, was not a, a, an objection, was not a valid objection to uh, the jurisdiction of a domestic court like the Belgian courts, and uh, but the case of universal jurisdiction was not dealt with by the court. The court didn't say uh, anything about that. On the opposite, uh, in uh, 2000, uh, I think it was in 2012, in the Issel Abre case, uh, the, it was a real case of universal jurisdiction, and then. Uh, we won the case, uh, we fully won the case, and the court considered that, uh, according to what Belgium said, uh, Senegal was obliged either to prosecute uh, Issel Abre for uh, the crimes which were attributed to him when uh, he was the ruler of uh, Chad, and uh, if Senegal did not prosecute him, so yet to be extradited where uh, a state which would like to prosecute him. And in fact, that was the case of Belgium. And as you know, uh, finally, uh, 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 Senegal did not extradite uh, Issel Abre, but Issel Abre was prosecuted in Senegal through an international criminal court, which was an ad hoc criminal court, which was set up uh, by the African Union uh, with, the, 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 with the cooperation of Senegal and also from, a, uh, from a, a financial point of view, it was financed mainly by the European Union, by the United States, also by some states like Belgium or the Netherlands uh, uh, who brought money in order to organize uh, this trial. Uh, well, the, the law was changed 
in uh, 2002, after uh, the, the, the judgment which was given by the court in the Yerodia case, DRC versus Belgium, the law was changed. And uh, in fact, today, it is always possible to uh, use universal jurisdiction, but it is submitted to the agreement of the federal prosecutor. The federal prosecutor has the right to see if there is a real uh, possibility to uh, prosecute uh, the presumed perpetrator of uh, international law crime abroad, uh, uh, if there is no a better possibility to prosecute this person, for instance, before an international criminal tribunal or international criminal court like the ICC, for instance. And uh, if there is, if the, uh, the case is not ill-founded, that's the reason why uh, Professor Ambers is, of course, fully right to say that uh, what is the most important thing is evidence. Uh, it's really uh, very substantial to have evidence uh, against uh, the accused. And uh, if these conditions are fulfilled, no problem, uh, the person can be prosecuted. Uh, should the person, should the indicted be present in Belgium, it's not specifically, it's not expressly, explicitly said in the law. Of, in, in fact, the law only says that, uh, that Belgium has jurisdiction and universal jurisdiction in cases where international law obliges states to exercise jurisdiction. And in fact, when you look at the instruments which uh, criminalize uh, international crimes, crimes uh, against humanity, uh, through uh, international custom mainly, or torture uh, through the 1984 conventions, or like uh, uh, about 20 other international conventions, you see that in fact, the obligation to prosecute is always uh, the application of the Latin maxim, out de dore, out judicare. It means uh, either you extradite or you, uh, you prosecute, you judge. And uh, there is, in some conventions, uh, it's not out de dore, out unicare, but it's more uh, what I could say in Latin, unicare vel de dore, like in the in, in, in IHL, uh, in the Geneva Conventions, it, does, it is not said that uh, uh, authors, uh, perpetrators of uh, IHL crimes must be uh, uh, the object of a request for extradition in order to get the uh, uh, obligation to prosecute. In fact, each state, each belligerent state is obliged to uh, investigate concerning any IHL crimes, even if there is no request for extradition concerning the person. But in fact, when you look at the, the wording of, uh, the, of common article, uh, the, the number changes uh, in each of the four con Geneva Conventions, uh, in fact, it's always when, when you read carefully the wording of the, uh, of the, of the rules, uh, I'm thinking of article 130 of the Third Geneva Convention, 147 of the uh, Fourth Geneva Convention. Uh, it's always when the, the presumed, the alleged perpetrator is found on the Belgian, on, on the territory of the prosecuting state. Uh, so uh, you, you see that there are in Belgium some kind of limitation through this reference the way uh, we, we can uh, prosecute. But in fact, uh, 
it did not prevent Belgium to exercise universal jurisdiction, uh, namely in the case of Rwanda uh, during uh, the 90s and, uh, and uh, the, the 2000 years, uh, where different uh, people who were indicted with genocide or with crimes against humanity, and mainly with war crimes committed during uh, the situation in Rwanda in 1994, these persons were uh, indicted and condemned uh, at the end uh, before Belgian courts. So that's the situation actually uh, in Belgium. And uh, of course, yes, when, uh, I forgot to tell you that one of the reasons which could prevent the federal prosecutor to allow, to authorize an investigation would be the, uh, the fact that the, the accused is protected by uh, immunity from criminal jurisdiction. Uh, that's, of course, that was the lesson that was one of the, of the main effects of the uh, Yerodia case, uh, where uh, unfortunately, which was a, a very bad judgment, of course, <laughs> I'm not uh, preventing myself to say that it was a very bad judgment because the court did not answer anything to Belgian arguments, mainly the arguments which were drawn from uh, the, the works of the uh, International Law Commission or from the Nuremberg judgment, for instance, where it was very clear that, in fact, uh, either procedural uh, issue, procedural objection based on immunity or substantive objection uh, founded on the, the, the function of the accused were not objections, were not valid objections to the uh, jurisdiction of the Nuremberg Tribunal. Uh, but the court did not answer anything to this argument or to the arguments uh, which were drawn from the working uh, of the, the International Law Commission. I'm uh, thinking of the uh, project of, of the draft, the draft code on crimes against mankind of 1996, uh, and uh, the court did not answer anything uh, about that. That's the reason why I always, I always consider that it's a, a very bad judgment. But that was the judgment, and so we have, of course, to comply with it. And so if, if uh, uh, the, the alleged perpetrator uh, of an international law crime is found in Belgium, but if he is, uh, it, it is, uh, is in function, if, he, if he's a, an incumbent uh, member of the government, uh, of his government, for instance, or her government, for instance, that's a, a real uh, uh, obstacle to the proceedings. So that's the, the status of the Belgian legislation uh, for, uh, for the present of today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor David. Before we will switch to questions, uh, we also have a short video of command by Professor uh, of our Mikolas Ramirez University, Andres Navarro, who is also a judge at the Lithuanian Supreme Court uh, in criminal section. So now I would like to ask Jonas to run the video and, and to see his comments about universal jurisdiction matters here in Lithuania. Доброе утро всем участникам семинара. Дамы и господа, белорусский народ сегодня переживает непростую и поистине судьбоносную эпоху. Белорусы полны решимости вырваться из под авторитарного, ничего общего с правами человека, не имеющего правления, и двигаться по пути строения правового государства. Однако, как показывает сегодняшняя ситуация в Беларуси, достичь этой цели не просто даже в 21 веке. 
It's not easy, even in the first century. В режим в целях самосохранения применяет силу и насилие против собственного народа. Сегодня факт использования принуждения и насилия против собственного народа обсуждается широко и в разных разрезах. Но я думаю, что в этой тематике самым важным вопросом является вопрос ответственности. Сегодня сама проблема режима и насилия против мира граждан уже привлекли внимание других государств, в особенности государств-членов Европейского Союза. Все мы знаем о пакетах санкций и их содержании, однако очевидно, что белорусский народ хочет большего. Важнейшим вопросом сегодня является вопрос привлечения к уголовной ответственности виновных в насилии и смерти ни в чем не повинных граждан. Всем известно, что территориальный принцип является фундаментальным. Его первенство в системе других принципов также общепризнано, что верховенство территориальной юрисдикции может быть отказано только в том случае, если ее применение не может быть реализовано в связи с совершением конкретного преступления. Более чем очевидно то, что территориальная юрисдикция не может быть применена для того, чтобы на законных основаниях оценивать то зло, которое создано и создается в эти дни Беларуси, а также создавалось и на протяжении долгих лет действия режима. Очевидно, что режим не желает, не может и не сможет преследовать самого себя. Именно в этом контексте возникает проблема применения универсальной юрисдикции в целях решения задачи о применении универсальной юрисдикции. Сначала мы должны определиться с кругом преступлений, которые могут меняться лидеру режима и его верным слугам. Поскольку говорит об уголовной ответственности, которая построена на универсальной юрисдикции, мы сможем только в случае совершения международного преступления или преступления международного характера. Другой важный вопрос – это решение о том, какой субъект международного права будет применять решение о возбуждении уголовного дела на основе универсальной Оба вопроса очень непростые и сложные. Да, я осведомлен о лимитах времени для изложения своего мнения, поэтому, чтобы избежать детальных и сложных толкований, скажу только то, что, по моему глубокому убеждению, по крайней мере, политический лидер режима действительно несет ответственность за такое обращение с людьми, которое запрещено международным правом. Это мнение основано на том, что каждый из нас, даже будучи на расстоянии от того, что происходило и происходит в Беларуси, мог и может наблюдать за умышленными и систематическими нападениями на мирные жители, мирное население Беларуси которые выражаются в форме задержания быток, нарушения основных норм международного права, серьезных форм сексуального насилия и, и других подобных бесчеловечных действий, которые выражаются в форме тяжелых страданий, в форме тяжелых телесных повреждений или наносящих серьезный вред психическому или физическому здоровью человека. Кроме того, я считаю, что на сегодняшний день имеется достаточно доказательств того, что в течение многих лет государственная политика проводилась таким образом, что в результате такой деятельности несколько человек просто исчезли. 
а политические власти упорно отказываются сообщать об их судьбе. Долгие годы власть себя ведет так, как будто эти люди никогда и не существовали. Это значит только одно. Режим давно решил пойти против своего народа, против безоружных людей. Другими словами говоря, режим проводит организованные, систематические и массовые действия, которые в контексте преступлений против человечности называются не иначе, как криминальной политикой. Надеюсь, вы согласитесь, что поведение нынешнего, пусть и фактического политического руководителя Беларуси, а также и тех, кто непосредственно осуществляет жизнь и его преступную политическую волю, и используя значительные государственные ресурсы, включая государственную систему власти и экономику, нарушает не только права человека, но и общественные принципы международного права. Решая вопрос о возбуждении уголовного дела в соответствии с универсальной юридикцией, становятся важными следующие юридические факты. Во-первых, Беларусь не является участником Римского статута международного суда. Ясно, что в дальнейшей ситуации Официальные власти Беларуси не будут обращаться в Международный уголовный суд с просьбой о расследовании уже упомянутых событий. Во-вторых, мы очень хорошо знаем, что по этим вопросам не будет запроса и от Совета безопасности Организации Объединенных Наций. Так как мы очень хорошо знаем, кто там пользуется правом бета. В таком случае компетенцию принимать решение о возбуждении уголовного преследования на основе универсальной юрисдикции может тот суверен, у которого в уголовном законодательстве есть утвержден как сам универсальный принцип юрисдикции, так и сами преступления против человечества. Возникает вопрос, может ли Литва быть таким суверенным? Универсальный принцип уголовной юрисдикции в Уголовном кодексе Литовской Республики закреплен в статье номер 7. Содержание соответствующей нормы четко декларирует, что Литва формально обладает компетенцией преследовать в судебном порядке всех, кто совершил в том числе и преступления против человечности которые совершены за пределами территории Литвы. В Уголовном кодексе Литовской республики преступления против человечности указаны в статье номер 100. Но при обсуждении этой темы важным становится вопрос, что может дать толчок к возбуждению уголовного дела. Другими словами, возможно ли Возбуждение уголовного дела, если в Литве нет подозреваемых. Он нигде не объявлен в международный розыск, нет никаких заявлений потерпевших, нет ничего, кроме того, что есть убеждение, что преступление против человечности совершается в Беларуси Доктрина международного уголовного права и практика конкретных суверенных государств говорят о том, что сам факт установления универсальной юрисдикции в Уголовном кодексе сам по себе недостаточно для возбуждения уголовного преследования на основе универсального принципа. Нужен еще какой-то дополнительный факт, которым, по крайней мере, может быть и заявление жертв таких преступлений. Так как очевидно, что на нашей территории самих виновных совершения международных преступлений точно не будет. Следует отметить и то, что в уголовном судопроизводстве Литвы также существует возможность судебного разбирательства в отсутствии обвиняемых. Этот аспект, по моему убеждению, только подтверждает, что возможно...
возбуждение уголовного дела за преступления, которые в том числе не имеют ничего общества с Литвой и могут преследоваться в Литве на основании универсальной юрисдикции. Все, что требуется, это серия заявлений и свидетельских показаний жертв преступлений или их родственников, если сами жертвы преступления пропали без вести или мертвы. Чтобы удостовериться в том, что они потерпели не по каким-то другим причинам, а в результате такого действия, которое запрещено международным правом. Но проблема в том, что это очень легко сказать. Все мы прекрасно понимаем, что соответствующие инициативы Литвы — это не только вопрос правоприменения. В этом случае мы сначала сталкиваемся с необходимостью политической воли, потому что соответствующее поведение Литвы незамедлительно вызовет негативную реакцию со стороны режима. И, конечно, таких государств, которые поддерживают сегодняшний режим Беларуси. С другой стороны, если государство ограничивается наблюдениями, санкциями, и будут отмежеваться от уголовно-паровой оценки зверств, происходящих в Беларуси, то возникает вопрос, как обеспечить общепризнанное стремление не мириться с безнаказанностью таких преступлений, и как тогда такие преступления предотвратить в дальнейшем. Спасибо за внимание и хорошего всем здоровья. Okay, so we heard comments of uh, uh, Professor Andrus Nevera from Lithuanian side of you. Uh, now I would like if, uh, if it's possible to hear me. Okay, uh, now I would like to switch to questions, answers and comments session. And we have request from the member of parliament of European parliament Andrus Kubilus to, to give his, his reaction and he's the one who is uh, very much uh, involved with organization of these issues and uh, cha championship of Belarusian cause. So, uh, uh, Andrews, please, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Justinus. Uh, good, good morning to everybody. I hope that you can hear me. Uh, and... Uh, I will try very briefly to say just a uh, few, few words. And maybe I will switch to Russian language <laughs> because uh, my, 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 my sentences will be exactly um, uh, directed to, to our friends from Belarus. Всем привет из Вильнюса. Hello to everybody from Vilnius. Uh, Brussels is closed. Yeah. So I'm here in Vilnius. Well, first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate you for the initiative. The seminar is very good, it's very deep. I'm not a lawyer myself, but many things uh, have become very clear to me after the seminar. Also, I would like to congratulate the European Humanity University. I'm somehow linked to the university, to the member of the uh, board. And I would like to first a couple of ideas uh, that we're discussing in the European Parliament. Of course, the very idea that Belarus needs the help of the international community, Belarusian people, Belarusian society needs the help of the community. We have discussed it from the very beginning of the events and what we saw exactly the right of the election from the street of Belarusian cities. And that led uh, to the fact that uh, just recently we had a seminar. Some um, of the people who are so today also participated in this, well, not a seminar, but the general meeting of the Committee on uh, Human Rights in the European Parliament. 
where we discuss uh, what the European Union could do, members of the European Union could do for the international community to help the Russian society to achieve the legal investigation of uh, the crimes that we all saw. And so now we have uh, an initiative and an idea, and I would like to address uh, my Lithuanian politics and also uh, the lawyer of the international community, and especially those who work the European Communities University. But now we have an idea that the European Parliament, uh, different uh, institutions of the European Union, uh, foundations as well, could help to create, uh, maybe in Vilnius, it's going to close, uh, maybe close to the university, to create some kind of special center uh, for investigation of the crimes of the regime. Uh, for uh, collecting the evidence uh, that is being collected already, and maybe together with the center, there could be a council of international lawyers organized near the center to move this course forward. And I hope that Lithuania and the new government can do a significant role here, uh, because this is important. Of course, this is important for Belarusian society at present, but also this is important to stop the crimes that uh, we're seeing today. But finally, this is also important uh, as a preventive initiative uh, that uh, other countries, especially the countries of the former Soviet Union, the authoritarian regimes that are thinking of uh, repeating the bad experience uh, of Lukashenko, uh, they should uh, have a clear idea that the international community has enough to, to, to respond to that. So this is my comment. Uh, I don't have any question. Uh, just uh, I would like to uh, give good wishes to everybody and let's move this course forward together. And I think the European Community University can play a very important role here. Thank you. Uh, if you know, can I say a couple of words? Uh, I would just like to thank you, Andrews, at your office and your secretary, because uh, their work was so uh, professional and effective uh, in such a short period of time. Such a small group was able to do so much work to prepare it to invite uh, our experts uh, for this meeting and uh, I'd also like to uh, thank the Konrad Adenauer Foundation uh, that uh, works with you, so that's why this cooperation, uh, this production. Now we're saying thank you to Jonas uh, directly. Uh, so yeah, and let's continue doing our common cause. Okay, I will switch to English perhaps. Back, because um, we already have uh, at least one question, but uh, I will also have a question if it's, if it's not a problem. So it's a question for uh, Professor Ambos, and question uh, relates to the states which do not ratify the Rome Statute. Which possibilities we have in international crime law to punish these states besides from the legal situation in Germany? And uh, well, the 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 uh, Alicia who is asking questions that doesn't know that Belarus is a member of the Roman Statute. No, Belarus is not a member, but there are many other states which do not ratify the Rome Statute. So, um, do you have uh, any comments on this specific question? Uh, how we can involve more international institutions in, in these situations? Uh, I mean, uh, there are maybe two two levels uh, to answer this. I mean, one issue is what can we do when a state has not ratified the Rome Statute, like in the case of Belarus, which is of concern to us right now. And of course, it would be possible to have a referral by a security council, which happened, for example, in Libya, which is not a state party either, but as 
we all know this will not happen in Belarus, given the Russian veto. So that's clear. The other possibility would be that other nationals of state parties, not nationals of Belarus, uh, for example, let's, let's hypothetically think of a national of Estonia or Lithuania uh, commits crimes or is involved or is victim of, uh, of a crime, and then you could have jurisdiction of the ICC. So we have a, a personality or nationality clause in Article 12 of the ICC statute. So that, that's, a, that's another rare situation, which I think is not really practical for Belarus. As, as far as I know, no, there are only Belarus perpetrators and Belarus victims. So there are no foreigners involved. Um, and that's why we are in this situation that we need third states or we need uh, what has been said by the member of parliament, Kubilius, is very important, I think. This idea of having a center which collects the evidence in a centralized way um, and uh, is supported by different initiatives. I mean, this, this is, I think this is a very good project for the situation when we will have a chance to prosecute. I mean, you, we, we have to think this always uh, uh, think in, in mid or long term. History has, has taught us that people will fall down, things change, and then we may have a chance to prosecute. Thank you very much uh, for your answer. Professor David, maybe you would like to add something to, to it? Uh, your uh, microphone. Oh, okay. No, no, it works. Uh, yes, uh, I, I quite agree with what uh, Professor Ambos uh, just said, and uh, uh, I have nothing in particular uh, to add, uh, except that even if uh, Belarus uh, is not a, a state party to uh, the ICC statute, uh, but anyway, uh, any state uh, in the world. Uh, through universal jurisdiction, is able, is legally able to prosecute uh, the perpetrator, the alleged per per perpetrators of uh, international crimes which have been committed uh, in, uh, in Belarus. Uh, but of course, what is really important is that uh, the alleged perpetrator is found on the territory of the prosecuting state. It's very interesting that we have some, some interesting things also in the chat. Marina uh, Ulyashina is writing to us, actually, actually there are international victims. For example, Dutch journalist who was injured during the attack of 9th of August two, uh, 2020, also a US citizen who was jailed for a long time. So uh, US from the territoriality principle, of course, is off because no ICC, but for the Dutch journalists, as far as I know, ne Netherlands also have a specific branch for dealing with international crimes. So uh, based on this, actually, uh, um, uh, on this uh, comment, I would like also to ask for some clarification uh, because uh, both Professor Ambos and Professor David, you have mentioned that uh, if you are coming to the prosecutor uh, at the national level, let's say German prosecutor or Belgian prosecutor, you need to have evidence prepared. So my question is, uh, could uh, the uh, members of, let's say, Belarusian exodus can, can um, perform this role? For example, if uh, people from, from Belarus who uh, uh, are refugees, let's say in Germany, will come to German or Belgian prosecutor with a request to, uh, uh, to, to, to start a case against uh, Belarusian officials. Uh, is it, uh, well, from the point of view, from the legal point of view, perhaps it's real. What about uh, from the, from the uh, let's say, practical point of view? Uh, what are the chances of success? What are the chances that prosecutor will uh, uh, devote his time to, to start case in a such instance? Uh, can I? 
Yeah, please, uh, Eric. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, well, in Belgium, uh, the things are uh, very clear because according to uh, Article 12 uh, bis of the uh, uh, Criminal Proceedings Code, it is provided for that an investigation can be open only if there is a neutralization of the federal prosecutor. And so officially, well, maybe not by official ways, but officially an investigation can be opened by an investigating judge only if there is uh, the permission which is given by the federal prosecutor. Otherwise it's not possible. But of course, it's always possible <laughs> to have some arrangements uh, from this point of view. But it would not be official. It would not be official. Yes, I think it's a, it's a very, very important uh, question. And that is really the, the, the crux of the matter. And that's why I wanted to be very practical. But thanks for the question to, to be able to clarify. Because we are in a gray area here. I mean, one is the issue of jurisdiction. I mean, as we have explained in both countries, Belgium and Germany, we have substantive jurisdiction. That's not the issue. The issue is how do we get a case um, developed in our jurisdictions? And um, if we had a situation where a possible perpetrator would be on German territory, as we have in the Syrian situation, or in the 19th in the Serbian situation, then today the position would be of the federal prosecutor and the general criminal policy position of our federal ministry of justice. And that's what Eric David mentioned, the outdated or judicata, we cannot be a safe heaven for perpetrators. So we have to do something about it. That, that's, that's a, that's, that would be the easy case. So if, you know, if someone from Belarus, I mean, you always have the situation that someone is, is even within the security forces is then leaving. You know, that's what happened in Syria. And then they, they come to Germany and then this person would be in Germany and we would have torture evidence and then we would do something about it. If we bring the evidence to the prosecutor. Now, the question is more difficult if we do not have a person on the territory. Let's say you go against the president or you go against the minister of interior, the former police, <laughs> the Minsk police uh, uh, boss, uh, former, the minister of interior, and you do not expect that this person comes to Germany. And then we have a big discussion here where some people like myself, Klaus Kress and others take the position that we have to have um, kind of reserve investigations. I call this reserve in German. There is a, is a, a complicated German word um, in Vorrats Ermittlung. Actually, you do an investigation which may be just for the dustbin, you know, because maybe this person never comes or dies in, in Belarus, you know, and then it's, it's, it, you have done it for nothing except maybe for the record. You could put it later in, in a documentary center, but um, our position is in this case, if you have such grave crimes and if we have resources, that's a practical issue. Of course, you always know in times of terrorist attacks, Vienna these days and uh, right wing terrorism in my country, Islamist terrorism, uh, the, the, all resources go to this investigation. So it's a qu practical question of how many people you have in the police and in the, in the prosecutor who can take time and do this. And so the, the argument, the counter argument against this investigations for the possibility in the near future that someone comes to Germany is always, well, we have not enough staff. We, we do not have enough. We cannot. That's a luxury. We, you know, we have other things to do. But um, so, Justina, that's a very, very important question. But the other thing is you have to have a coalition. That's what I said before. You need, for example, a German NGO here. You need some, perhaps some academics and you bring in the Belarus and uh, other uh, people. And then we have a kind of Belarus coalition for prosecuting crimes in Belarus and Germany. And then you can uh, build a certain pressure. That's, that's, that's not just law here. It's about media attention, you know, as long as Belarus is in the attention. And it will be very difficult for the federal prosecutor in Germany to say, no, we do nothing. You know, if you bring a good case, against high-ranking officials and you have people, we have a date in, in Karlsruhe or these days we have a Zoom meeting, you know, with them 
and 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 then we can we can build up pressure and that will be in the news so that's that's another way so you have to talk to these people and people are very open right now to to open up uh, these possibilities Okay, yes. Thank you very much. Yes, Tarek, please. So, sorry, but I, I have to leave, unfortunately, because uh, I, I have a, an important uh, professional appointment on a, a tennis court <laughs> at 12. <laughs> so, unfortunately, okay, yeah, th th to... thanks a lot, Professor David. <laughs> it was a pleasure to see you. <laughs> so, yes, please. Bye. See you later, I hope. Goodbye. Goodbye. Um, goodbye. goodbye. Uh, and maybe another thing, Justina, just to, to uh, add something which we had a discussion yesterday, this, this European level, we should maybe more look at the European cooperation here. You know that we have in Eurojust, in, in The Hague, the, the cooperation of the European Union prosecution services. We have a specific, um, in European secondary law, but also in practical terms, we have a specific focus on international crimes. So if the, the issue is one of the European Union, we can use the cooperation mechanism within the European Union, uh, European, Eurojust, European Judicial Network, to put more pressure and, and then one could, be, and on this cooperation level, one could define a state who takes care because there is another issue. Not, not every European state must take a case. You know, you could, you could think of, let's take the Dutch or the, or the Germans, whoever. I mean, uh, just to, to be more pragmatic. And, and so we should more use, and therefore very important, the intervention by the member of parliament should much more use this European level of coordination, you know, and, and have a kind of co coordinated effort. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I also have one more question in Russian, but I, I will translate it into English because it, it's really interesting. Um, so, um, Raisa Mikhailovskaya, she's writing, we have a victim who is a citizen of Israel. Uh, can we, uh, can we um, start a case in such a situation? I just wonder who are those we. So, Raisa, if you hear me, 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 what do you mean by we? Who can uh, initiate such a case? Who do you mean? I'm, I'm, I'm just, just making some clarification. Ah, okay. Uh, Belarusian Documental Center, uh, Belarusian Document Center. Uh, so, from my point of view, I think uh, Belarusian Document Center can do, uh, well, can collect all the evidences, but the cases are for, for the, for the uh, legal institutions. So, uh, as far as I know, Israel is not a member of uh, International Criminal Court as well. So, uh, and, uh, but perhaps they also have universal jurisdiction uh, Professor Ambos, are you a little bit acquainted with Israel practice? No, you have, I mean, we have the famous Eichmann case in Israel. Yeah, of course. <laughs> remember, and, and, and Israel has certainly nationality principles. That would be a very easy case. I mean, it's a bit cynical, but if we had a German victim, it would be very easy to get a case <laughs> running. If a German journalist would be killed in Belarus <laughs> yeah, of from the Frankfurt Allgemeine or mm -hmm. Süddeutsche Zeitung at best, then we would have an easy case because that's nationality and all states mm -hmm. have nationality in a, in a certain way. So that would... You just have to get to the authorities to make them aware that there is an Israeli citizen killed and, and the Israeli prosecutor would certainly start. I think Mr. Wallenstein wanted to say something. Yes, yes. Uh, we, uh, well, I'd like to, to finish with question and answers and I, I will give, uh, give the floor to the Jakob because uh, I know that he has something to say. Okay, so um, I guess we don't have any more questions. I'm just checking who can answer situation one moment uh, on the screen now. Okay, so uh, Jakob, uh, if, you, if you have anything to add, uh, so please, you are most welcome. Uh, thank you so much. I didn't so much raise my hand as just to give a thumbs up to uh, all those good ideas and initiatives that already came up today. I am very humble in this uh, whole conversation since I know so little about all these questions, although I had a few semesters of uh, European and international law during my studies, which is some years back. Uh, it was a lot that I could learn today. And I think this initiative 
um, is a very, very good example uh, within this basket, which we have been discussing with Mr. Kobilius, but with other partners from uh, EHU in Lithuania, in Germany, through all these weeks and months, the question, what uh, is that that uh, the European Union or international partners can do, which is sensible, because this question keeps, or this, this, this remark keeps coming back that we don't really have a lot of leverage in Belarus. But I think um, uh, this legal approach is uh, one of the most, most clear aspects to me, which, which can be of help, which is concrete and, and which um, is, is both in the sense of helping uh, people, but also bringing those to justice who broke law of their exist of their own country. I think this is something which we also keep have to keep repeating. This is not, um, as some propagandists say, the international or Western community trying to bring their uh, uh, alien values to Belarus, but it's people breaking existing law. Uh, and therefore, I thought this was a very, very good and useful um, uh, convention that we had today. And there are so many ideas around to continue this. So I'm very humble and, and thankful that we could be a, a part of this as co-organizers. Um, I would be obviously very happy to also continue with the initiative if Germany can take more of a role in this, be it in coordinating, uh, bringing experts to the table or being uh, part of a facilitator to set up uh, a European um, initiative or whatever it can be, how much formalized it needs to be, um, just to signal, um, I think this is absolutely the way to go to continue this conversation. So thank you uh, for all the experts. Thank you for the organizers. Uh, looking forward to continuing and learning more on this very important topic. Uh, thank, thank you, so you much, very Jacob. much, yes, Conrad Adenauer Foundation. And indeed, we would like to stay in touch. And it was very important and very quick response to all our questions regarding experts, translation, everything was done perfectly. Thank you. Okay, so perhaps it is time to wrap up uh, this uh, really interesting and I think useful uh, event. So I would like perhaps to make a few points uh, from, the, from the reports that we've heard and from the opinions and insights we shared. Uh, perhaps now we are on a way that the main issue is preparation. A preparation to be ready to go to international justice, even though uh, now our chances are quite strained, let's say by the by the framework, by the uh, current regime, but it does not uh, does not uh, uh, say that the things would not change, and it does not say that some national initiatives might be fruitful, as we just discussed the case with the with the Israeli citizen, with the citizens of other states. But of course, perhaps the, the most important thing is to gather evidences, to have uh, documents prepared, and having in mind that uh, Professor Ambo said that maybe uh, German prosecutors are clandestinely thinking about Belarus or, 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 or some other countries uh, also uh, trying to, to, to take into account this is really important, perhaps not to wait till the uh, international situation change, because we definitely won't have a, a quick change in an in a international legal framework. But to think about international organizations of different kind, again, that, that was mentioned by the Professor David, uh, uh, on European level, on international level, on, on United Nations level. So it is very important to uh, not to forget about this, and uh, uh, perhaps universal jurisdiction will not be able to give all the answers, but there's a still a possibility to keep it as a sort of Damoclus over the head of those persons who are responsible, and uh, I just would like to wish my best for our Belarusian colleagues, for NGOs, uh, who are living through such a hard times. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, in one way or another, justice will be served. So thanks a lot for the participation and for the possibility to moderate this discussion. Ludmila, thank you a lot.